Welcome. I'm your host, Paul Roberts. Welcome to Threat Post Now. This is a, a security news video, and we're here today to talk about virtualization and security. Virtualization is a huge trend in the technology sector, with Gartner predicting uh, adoption of both desktop and server virtualization to grow by something like 23% each year between now and 2014. Companies are investing a lot of money in moving their servers and user desktops to virtual platforms like VMware, Citrix, and Microsoft. But are there security implications of doing that? Do, does virtualization make your office more secure, less secure, no different? What types of tools are there to help protect virtual environments? We've got a couple guests in the studio today to help us answer some of those questions. Mike Wigley is the CEO of Cloud Connect. It's a hosted desktop virtualization company based in Natick, Massachusetts. Mike, welcome. Thank you for having me. Mike, tell us a little bit about Cloud Connect. So Cloud Connect is basically a, a total IT hosted solution for small and medium businesses. Uh, we specifically target clients that may have uh, privacy needs for their data. And being a multi-tenant environment uh, where we not only serve uh, client exclusively. We have multiple tenants, uh, multiple clients in our in our locations. Uh, we have a whole host of issues that, that must be tackled that are security related. Um, we're governed by various privacy laws from the mass data privacy law to clients that need to meet HIPAA requirements. So really our platform has to meet all of those challenges um, as well as some of the security rules and regulations that aren't yet written for uh, virtualization. And next to Mike, we have Tim Armstrong, who's a virus researcher at Kaspersky Lab. Tim, mm -hmm. welcome. Thank you. Tim, tell us a little bit about the work you do at Kaspersky. Um, uh, my job is primarily focused on researching uh, emerging threats. Um, I particularly focus on mobile malware and embedded technologies. Um, but we're really looking across the entire threat landscape to find new and emerging trends and, and ways to combat them. Great. Well, guys, uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, virtualization and security is a huge topic, and we, we have a limited amount of time. But we're going to try and hit kind of the important, the important points here. I think a good place to start, Mike, would be maybe for you to explain some of the key terms that, that get thrown a lot, around a lot with virtualization. What is desktop versus server virtualization? What are these hypervisors people are talking about? They're type 1 and type 2. What are those? Sure, there's, there's a, a, a broad new uh, jargon for virtualization in general. So presentation virtualization basically is, is the idea of creating a uh, desktop on demand with users' applications uh, where applications may be abstracted from the operating system where they're usually installed into and now hosted on a server and users access those on demand. When we get into actual VDI or virtual desktop infrastructure, uh, desktop virtualization requires a whole new level of server-based computing infrastructure known as a hypervisor. Uh, that's basically the ability to run multiple operating systems, uh, be it server, desktop, client, uh, database, on uh, a single piece of hardware. And with that comes a whole uh, range of architectures and, and challenges in terms of, of how to address security. Uh, there are generally two types of hypervisors. Uh, there's type 1, which installs bare metal onto the hardware. And uh, that's basically a lockdown um, OS kernel that's designed basically to run uh, the operating systems or a virtualization layer. Uh, type 2, uh, and that's basically where the virtualization layer is a, a role of a broader operating system. So in this case, you would take a physical piece of hardware, uh, install a, uh, an operating system and you may select a virtualization role uh, along with maybe several other roles, uh, internet information services, mm -hmm. certificate services, database server, where it's really an add-on to the underlying server suite. And your customers, or you said you're serving mostly small business, is security part of the, I mean, what's bringing them to Cloud Connect? Why are they looking at desktop virtualization, hosted desktops? instead of or as an alternative to what we're used to, which is single-tenanted Windows desktops for the most part. Sure. Um, I mean, the traditional client-server uh, or client-workstation server model uh, has, a, has a whole range of challenges. And in order to lock that down to the level that's necessary um, for customers to cost-effectively comply with uh, mass data privacy laws and, and HIPAA requirements, um, it, it, it 
really is, is almost impossible to do that cost effectively. Uh, what we do is we give them access to a, a hosted almost Fortune 100, Fortune 500 style class backend infrastructure. And uh, what that does is, uh, you know, generally by, by taking advantage of, of next generation internet speeds and, and better performance uh, across the WAN, we can now have a, uh, multiple small businesses basically uh, adopt an outsourced subscription model for virtualization rather than taking on the challenge of doing that in-house. Mm -hmm. um, the, the big component with virtualization though that makes it so much more secure from the client server model is the fact that the data never actually has to leave the data center. Mm -hmm. So with, with uh, display protocols whether you're completely with VMware and using uh, what's called PC over IP or use a Citrix uh, ICA protocol or Microsoft's RDP. Um, it, what, what's happening is users are interacting with, um, you could think of it as just, it, it's almost like having a monitor with a really long cord going back to the data center, a, a true terminal, uh, where they just see changing pixels and keystrokes and mouse clicks are relayed back to the data center. Mm -hmm. So they interact with these applications on demand from any device anywhere um, in, a, in a securely isolated environment but you never actually have to take the data out to get local-like performance. Kind of harkens back to the days of mainframes and dumb terminals where you just had your monitor and a keyboard and, and you know, the mainframe was, was running it, everything in the background. Exactly, and uh, now the approach with cloud is really taking the mainframe uh, off-site. And in order to do that, you have to have just excellent internet. And you also have to deal with some of the security issues that stem from that. Uh, so with us, unlike in a, in a normal, uh, normally virtualized environment that's say on site, where clients log in uh, over a local private network, every single one of our connections has to traverse the internet. So we're getting into issues of man in the middle attack, server authentication, um, a, uh, encryption, um, all those things that, that, that need to be dealt with, uh, as well as the performance issues, including uh, jitter, latency, right. and uh, temporary loss of connectivity. Right. Tim, that sounds like your territory. You've been <coughs> uh, researching viruses and malware for many years. Obviously, mm -hmm. we're used to the Windows world and Windows uh, malware on mm -hmm. basically Windows-based networks, corporate networks. How does the adoption of virtualization, both in the data center and in the desktop, change that? Well, I don't, I don't think it changes it dramatically. Um, the target is still the same. Um, you're still going to see uh, attackers going after uh, you know, Windows machines, whether they're a real Windows machine or whether they're housed in a data center and you have a virtual terminal connecting you to them. Um, you know, the prize is really still the data that's housed within them. So I don't think it dramatically changes the, uh, the environment. The things that you may see grow out of that may be things where attackers, instead of focusing directly on the Windows machine itself, may start to target the infrastructure. Um, you may see attacks directly against VMware, or um, you may see the researchers that look at vulnerabilities paying more attention to things like you know, hypervisors and, and the different layers, the, the Linux kernel, as you mentioned, um, attacking those directly so that they can potentially take over the entire network there rather than just one individual machine. So. Right. I mean, if you have these servers on the back end that are hosting hundreds or thousands of desktops or, or virtual server environments, those be themselves become very rich targets if Absolutely. you're interested in stealing data or intellectual property. Right. And, or if you just want to house, you know, if you're looking somewhere to power your botnet and you've got potentially thousands of machines um, at, your, at your disposal there, it does pre present a unique challenge. You mentioned botnets. I mean, do we see cyber criminal organizations, bad guys, leveraging virtualization as well, either in their malware or in their um, malicious um, operations? Not so far, really. Uh, the, the targets still are, you know, distributed. Uh, you know, we, we certainly see it in, in enterprises, and we, but we see it a lot in home networks as well. Um, it's, again, it, it's really still indicative of, of the, the current framework where, you know, the, the operating system is key here. You, you don't really care what host gets infected as long as enough hosts get infected. Right. So I, I don't see a, a paradigm shift at this point, but it's possible in the future we could. I know uh, what uh, the folks watching this are thinking, which is I've made investments in desktop antivirus, mm -hmm. in uh, network and desktop firewall, uh, intrusion detection, yep. uh, intrusion prevention, and so on. 
Right. Are, do all those become invalid if I move to a uh, hosted, you know, a, a virtual uh, data center or a hosted server, hosted desktop environment? Mm -hmm. What what still applies? What doesn't apply? What do I need to do differently? I would say it all still applies. I mean, your your investment's not lost at that point. Um, because you're you're looking at a different version of the same thing in some ways, um, you know I'm I'm sure these users still require internet access. They still need to visit websites. They still need to back data up. They still right. need to do all the same things. Um, so maybe how you deploy these things is different, but the overall usage and and the necessity is still the same. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't think it changes really in any great way. It just may be um, virtualization may provide even new ways to to affect these things and and hopefully we're growing smarter each time we roll out a new technology um, which may not be the case but you know with virtualization it does potentially allow through some of the application programming interfaces or some of the add-ons to add security um, at different layers or um, in addition to the existing layers so that every time you're adding a layer you're creating a higher bar of entry to an attacker um, so it may, you know, it may actually prevent you from being attacked, you know, before the next guy. But what I'm hearing you say is, look, if you were on uh, uh, Vista or XPSP2 and you're moving to a hosted XPSP2 mm -hmm. environment, you shouldn't assume that just because it's now hosted that the, you know, that the, there's been a suspension of the laws of, you know, malware, basically, that those oh, yeah. systems aren't just as vulnerable to malicious attack via email, you know, uh, web drive-by download. Traditional, sure. Well, and, and hopefully, I would, <laughs> I would really hope that somebody who's moving into uh, an infrastructure um, like, like Cloud Connect offers, that they don't have the opportunity to install, you know, XP, SP2, I, I hope, or even Vista for that matter. Right. I mean, right. You know, we've, we've seen again and again where um, Windows 7 64-bit provides a whole host of new security features that really raise the bar of entry to attackers. And, and I would really hope that, you know, that would be the, the operating system of choice. It probably is um, <clears throat> for, for virtual networks. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I think that that really it changes the environment essentially anyway. Okay. Mike, you, there, are, there are a few dominant virtualization platforms that are used out there. We mentioned VMware, um, Citrix, Microsoft. I know you're both a, your company is both a Citrix and Microsoft partner. Are there appreciable differences in, in terms of the protections that they offer within those platforms between them? I mean, what should people know about? There's what a lot of different things. Uh, there, there are areas where VMware is better. There's areas where Citrix is better. There's areas where uh, well, Citrix and Microsoft are very complementary. Um, they have a very solid partnership that's mm -hmm. been around for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And uh, they release uh, some commingled products as well. Uh, generally, what you'll find is, in, in my experience, uh, my preference is um, when dealing with the challenges of, of rendering an application usable and securely over the internet, that uh, the Citrix protocol has is really tried and, and true uh, in that regard. Uh, the virtualization layer, VMware definitely has a stronghold there. It's uh, probably the world's most trusted virtualization platform and has a stronghold in, in all the major data centers uh, as well as uh, just because of its role for server virtualization originally. Mm -hmm. And now uh, VMware is leveraging the fact that it's so good as a, uh, in, and efficient as a server virtualization platform that it could also be used as a desktop virtualization platform. Mm -hmm. So uh, Microsoft, uh, as, as a virtualization provider, their Hyper-V, which is their, uh, their virt operating system virtualization platform, mm -hmm. is, is still relatively new. Mm -hmm. uh, they have some great things coming in the, in the pipeline with Windows Server 8, uh, high availability features, uh, think, things of that nature. VMware is uh, basically adopting a, a services provider driven um, virtualization infrastructure with vSphere 5 where you can set SLA policies and kind of guarantee whatever security requirements or uptime and redundancy requirements are required for an individual tenant in your data center. So I've found that uh, I, I mean I tremendously trust uh, VMware in terms of uh, virtualizing the OS and I find the Citrix display protocol uh, has a wide range of options and tuning features depending on what your specific uh, network conditions are be it security issues or performance issues. Um, and, and that's why we've kind of hybridized the two in our environment 
uh, because it allows us to kind of deliver this type of a platform uh, cost effectively and a little bit, I would say, not ahead of its time, but, but using state-of-the-art technologies that are available today. Obviously, Citrix has its own hypervisor as well, the Zen server. I think traditionally Citrix has been involved in more of presentation server, where you would get a Windows server box, uh, install Citrix, uh, what is now called Zen app, or at the time presentation server onto it, and that would basically enable that operating system to virtualize the applications. Mm -hmm. And now Citrix has realized, well, we need to catch up in, in the area of server virtualization, step down a layer and start virtualizing the OS mm -hmm. in addition to um, the applications. So that's why just in terms of the, the business cultures and, and where they were at, that's why Citrix has the best display protocol. It's mm -hmm. because they've been using it for applications going sure. back 15, to 20 years. Yeah, right. right. Whereas VMware has been doing server virtualization right. that doesn't require a display protocol right. because you just have network services right. running on those servers. Right. Right. And now they're kind of adopting uh, you know, PC over IP to compete in some areas. Right. But they're very much complementary. Right. So different strengths and weaknesses based on where these companies are coming from historically. Exactly. Uh -huh. um, I, and companies, by and large, who are looking at either doing server virtualization, desktop virtualization, potentially, depending on the size of the company, this might be internally managed or they might be going with a, um, a third party provider like, mm -hmm. uh, like Cloud Connect. What types of security questions should they be asking? Um, and I, I, actually, both of you can probably weigh in on this, either to their internal IT staff uh, or to this provider. Uh, you know, what types of security features and precautions need to be taken to make sure that when when you make this migration, it's a it's a safe one. Sure, um, I, I think there's a lot of different uh, things that that should be discussed or can be discussed. A lot of it has to do with uh, the policies and procedures that uh, you know business has in place uh, to address virtual threats and uh, integrity of data. Even if a user accidentally deletes something, what's available from the service provider and where do I as a customer need to fill in if that's not sufficient for the goals and objectives of my organization? Um, that's one component. Who's going to be responsible for the antivirus? It's, it's about kind of clearly delineating who's responsible for what. So that's number one, is, is you do have to have a healthy conversation about you know, what your internal culture is. Disclose what types of activities you're involved in. Are you dealing with patient records? If you are, that's gonna put you under one class of regulations. Mm -hmm. you know, does your data center comply with that? More so than physical security, do your internal you know, virtual procedures or your architecture comply with that? It's about having a healthy conversation about what your needs are, making sure that they can accommodate those um, that the agreements are where they need to be. But a very big challenge is that cloud services are still very new. And companies aren't going to have reputations yet, just by virtue of the fact that we're on the state of the art of the technology right now. Right. Um, so we're, whether you go with a, a large provider like Amazon, for example, and do virtual private servers, mm -hmm. Earthlink is another one that, that provides virtual private servers, or a Cloud Connect where we're more kind of tailored towards uh, getting the applications delivered to the end user and being mm -hmm. responsible for that whole process. Mm -hmm. uh, you really need to do your homework to make sure that they're going to provide you with what you need. Tim, mm -hmm. should, should companies be concerned that, hey, look, if this clown who's running, who, who's got the virtual server next to me and I'm an Amazon customer or a Cloud Connect customer, they get infected with uh, Configure or some other malware that that's going to jump the fence into my virtual server environment? Well, as of right now, we really haven't seen anything of that nature. Um, but <clears throat> I think as virtualization grows, you, you, it's possible. I mean, there are, I've seen proof of, proof of concept um, research projects where people have been able to escape the sandbox of virtualization. Um, you know, and at this point, it's really only researchers doing it. But obviously, if researchers can do it, then somebody else can. Right. Um, and, and I think one of the important things m Mike kind of hit on was the responsibility. Um, the, the patch management is where you prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. So assigning responsibility at the correct place to, to you know, follow up with patches because you know, um, these virtual environments, at, and, you know, at the end of the day, they are so also our operating systems. They right. need to be maintained um, as well as the operating systems within these operating systems. So having a clear definition of you know, what happens when and who is in, in charge of it, and um, it can prevent things like, you know, these sandbox escapes or, or new threats we haven't seen yet, you know, that are 
going to develop and, and come forth as this technology grows. Right. And speaking about antivirus, you're an antivirus researcher. Mm -hmm. Is it the case that each one of these virtual machines is going to have its own instance of, you know, Kaspersky antivirus or, yeah. or whatever the antivirus software is? Or are those technologies as well adjusting so that they can run across a, a, a virtual environment? Well, I think you're going to see where you, you <coughs> kind of have pulled back the antivirus to a, a layer back. Um, it really just doesn't make sense to run a separate instance in every single VM. It just becomes you know, prohibitive um, from a processing perspective when you can potentially run it a layer back and have um, all the connections monitored to each VM. Um, or in the case of where you're bringing up individual images each time that are used, you know, single use, um, <clears throat> it, you know, it doesn't make sense to wait for all the load up and downloading all the database updates and things of that nature. Um, it's just prohibitive. So I think that what you'll see is, especially once you get, you know, past say, you know, 50 or 100 computers, you're going to have to have um, a solution that isn't single instance, um, just out of necessity. Virtual machines today still have many of the same properties of physical machines from a security perspective. Right. Uh, so, no, while we're generally unaware of, of any bit of virus jumping, say, the sandbox from one VM to another VM uh, ever happening, it can still happen over the network. Uh, so how do you keep your tenants isolated from a network perspective to make sure that if you do have a virus outbreak on a virtual machine, if it's, if it's gotten past your first layer of defense, that it's contained and doesn't you know, escape and, and move to the next level. Detection is a big component of that, making sure somebody's notified when that happens, right. or that someone monitoring the data center knows that that's happened. Um, to, to respond to that and isolate the machine, deal with the problem at that, at that point in time. Right. But you certainly will need to see uh, some level of, I, I think, consolidated antivirus management and uh, I think VMware definitely recognizes this w with some of their uh, stuff that's coming in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And uh, while we're still kind of in this in-between area, there's been some technologies from antivirus providers that, that allow uh, randomization of updates and scans to reduce the overall load on the environment uh, in, that comes from running uh, every single or multiple instances of the same uh, malware detection. Sure. And of course, the, Tim, I think as you pointed out earlier, VMware, Citrix, Microsoft themselves, the, the underlying architecture or technology that supports virtualization is just software also, so potentially yep. containing vulnerabilities that could be attacked and exploited as well. Absolutely. Do we see any evidence that that's happening, that there's interest within the cyber underground or amongst malware authors in saying, you know, forget about the hosted Windows instance, mm -hmm. let's go after the VMware server itself? Yeah. Not in any large scale way. Um, you know, again, the prize is still the, the operating system at the mm -hmm. end of the pipe, um, but uh, it's really hard to predict where that's going to go in, say, a year. Right. Um, you know, we've, uh, I'm sure we've both seen the rapid uh, adoption of virtualization technologies, and if that continues on the trend it's on, then we right. can ex certainly expect it. Definitely. I think they're taking the approach of uh, a hypervisor should fall into the same class as a, a router or right. a network switch, right. Right? something that right. you don't run a malware in, right. that it should be so locked down and so lightweight you can't even you know, install or execute code that isn't digitally signed, right. and there's no override for that. Right. Uh, that's definitely the position of VMware in, in their latest release. Okay. But again, we're seeing you know, certificates being stolen as well. So even with right. digital signing, you know, there's right. some potential for misuse. Exactly. Right. And in some case, the bare metal architecture isn't the best for a client. They may want the full-blown Hyper-V environment and have virtualization as an add-on. Right. And in that case, there may be challenges. And, and definitely, there is a, a, it should be a requirement to run an anti-malware in that situation. Yeah. And that malware architecture is going to be different when you're running you know, virtual machines as a, as a role in the overall operating system, that malware architecture is going to be different than you know, traditional client desktop anti-malware. Right, absolutely. And I guess it's important to note as well, because sometimes we can have magical thinking about new technologies, uh, that you know, many breaches, many incidents ultimately come down to users and user behavior uh, and not to the underlying technology. So, Virtualization won't necessarily help you if you open a malicious attachment or go to a you know a malicious website. Well, it, um, it can certainly assist though, because as Mike was saying, you know, they force an Active Directory environment. 
um, if used correctly, you can lock down a lot of these. Sure. You know, you don't need all these users having administrator level permissions. Right. So exactly. Right. It can right. certainly help. And okay. it's very important to embrace Active Directory in your virtualization layer as well. Um, you know, join the hypervisors to a domain if necessary. Right. Uh, make sure those who have access to the hypervisors are restricted by Active Directory policies. Still doesn't excuse having that Active Directory root as part of an organization's security architecture. Hmm. Okay. Well, we're uh, in November, it's almost the end of the year. Uh, a good place to wrap up maybe would be for you gentlemen to look into your crystal balls and uh, give us some thoughts or predict predictions for 2012, both in terms of the virtualization landscape, in terms of adoption, but also threats, malware, attacks. A year from now, things gonna look pretty much the same or, or are we gonna see uh, more news uh, around virtualization and security? I think we're going to see dramatic change uh, from, a, I mean, just a virtualization adoption component. Uh, these multi-tenant models are going to become more and more common and that's going to increase the attack surface of virtualization. Um, it, now you're going to have data centers that are going to be more encompassing as opposed to having a situation where users have servers in the back room. Uh, big component of this, I think, is uh, we see with the recession, a lot of businesses have held off on infrastructure spending, and these outsourced subscription models are going to allow them to update uh, outdated infrastructure uh, without any capex. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one big enabler. And the second one is, uh, I think, just the ever-evolving internet. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can get a, a business Verizon Fios connection uh, very affordably. is almost a cross-grade to any connection you may have right now and you'll see that the quality of service is, is impeccable um, and that it's also symmetric, so the download is equal to the upload speed. Right. That's a huge component of a, uh, of a cloud uh, type of an architecture. Right, to making it successful, yeah. Um, I, the other thing to mention here too is that uh, traditionally we've seen a lot of malware that uses anti-virtualization technology so that uh, you know, researchers such as myself you know, can't bring the malware into a virtual environment, take it apart a number of times, and watch what it does over and over again. Well, if, if all these different companies do move into a virtual infrastructure, that won't really be something that you can do anymore. So um, it may actually make you know, my life easier um, because you, it, you just won't be able to attack people and, and protect yourself in that way. Right, so those anti-virtualization features will hinder propagation of the malware itself. Right, right. right. A, a big thing that I think, I mean, and maybe we haven't talked about this as much as um, users will be using thin clients instead mm -hmm. of accessing um, you, you know, from a desktop or workstation, or we're seeing bring your own device to work yes. type of a model now. Right. Um, so how do we deliver these applications across a diversity of devices that have different operating systems and different architectures than what we've traditionally written malware for? Right. And that's a huge component of it as well. Right. And also the mobility uh, t trend as well. So, um, you know, it, how, how are we going to manage in a virtual environment the increasing number of, you know, iPhones, you know, exactly. iPads, Certainly. mobile exactly. devices that are going to be brought in, plugged into potentially right. uh, a virtual and, uh, container. Citrix is, is great with this. Is, uh, now they've released uh, receivers uh, for pretty much all major tablets, uh, mm -hmm. smartphones, uh, PDAs, uh, operating systems. So we have many clients that have Macs at home. Uh, right. Their users you know, may use a laptop, uh, MacBook, or uh, they may even now just have an iPad. And uh, they'll log into a Windows infrastructure via that device, and uh, it's secured by uh, the Citrix receiver. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us on ThreatPost Now. Thank you for having Thanks. us. Mike Wigley is the CEO of Cloud Connect, a hosted desktop provider based in Natick, Massachusetts. Tim Armstrong is a virus researcher at Kaspersky Lab. This has been another episode of Threat Post Now, our video series where we're talking about breaking issues in computer security. I'm your host, Paul Roberts. Thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you again soon.